Hi, I'm Bobby Smiley. I'm the Interim Director of the Divinity Library. I've been here since May of 2016. Thank you. Well, welcome to Vanderbilt Library's Poetry Room. We're conducting another series of the Book Club interviews. I'm Marianne Caton, and I work in Outreach, and I'm interviewing Bobby Smiley today. We wanted to ask people about the books that they love because, as Laura Miller wrote, the first book we fall in love with influences us just as much as the first person we fall in love with. So I have a set of series of questions I'd love to ask you, and if you could share your book clubs with us, that would be great. I'd be delighted to do so. Thank you. What was the first book you fell in love with? Well, it's funny, because I've been watching a few of these interviews um, since you asked me to participate, and I noticed that several of the uh, participants have cited encyclopedias as their first book club. And I have to say that that's true for me, too. In fact, actually, my colleague, Philip Walker, uh, and I share a mutual first book club. Um, when I was a kid in elementary school, I used to make a beeline during sustained silent period um, reading time to the World Book Encyclopedia. Uh, you know, those red leatherette covers that I would pull off the shelves and eagerly read through. And so um, I had an unslakeable thirst for knowledge. And I went through the whole thing, I think, between the ages of or between the ages of 8 and 11. Um, but I think, too, upon reflection, that it wasn't so much reading as such that I fell in love with. It was kind of a, a thirst for knowledge. So I thought about this question a little bit more, and I think the first book that I fell for in terms of it being a, a great kind of inventive, literary, creative work was actually Dr. Seuss's On Beyond Zebra. It's sort of a somewhat more obscure Zeus book, but um, Seuss book, but it's, um, as the title implies, um, a, an alphabet that is beyond the letter C. And what I appreciated about so much was that Seuss played with the kind of literary conventions and genres that I was most familiar with. I used to read the dictionary as a kid, too. So, encyclopedias, dictionaries, and he managed to use that kind of narrative grammar in a really inventive and imaginative way that stoked in me the possibilities of perhaps writing creatively while using these forms that I was already familiar with. Great. Have you reread it? Well, you know, it's funny because I, I haven't, but in many ways, um, that was influential later on, as I discovered perhaps in life, um, with uh, kind of metafictional work. So like the short stories of Jorge Luis Borges, who uses forms like uh, the literary essay, or he invents encyclopedias, or literary biographies to, um, to tell a story using those conventions, but at the same time sort of make these really inventive and creative philosophical points. Um, Italo Calvino's If on a Cold Winter Night, um, that book also kind of plays with the kind of metafictional conventions and situates you as a reader and pushed you through a story that turns out to be many stories in one. So um, in many ways, I guess I continued reading it even though I never picked it up again. Is there a book that really struck you before you got to college as a reader? What struck you about it? Um, I'd say John Savage's England's Dreaming. So John Savage is a literary journalist, a musical journalist, who authored this study of punk rock. And I was always a big music kid, and especially, you know, punk rock saved my life. So as a high schooler, I kind of devoured it. But what I appreciated about it was sort of twofold. One, I, I really liked, of course, learning about all my favorite bands. But the literary, or the historical and the cultural context of the book, that to me was um, really powerful because it informed not only the way the music sounded, but the kind of politics of the music, the way it looked, the way people dressed. And it showed to me that something like pop culture could be taken seriously as a study, as a site for academic study and, and reflection. So that book subsequently um, Brian Marcus's Lipstick Traces, Chuck Eddy's um, The Accidental History of Rock and Roll. These were all books that um, kind of introduced me to the idea that I could marry pop culture and um, and serious serious analysis and study. Great, thank you. Is there a book uh, that got you set on a professional path? Yes, I'd say that Peter Novick's That Noble Dream. Um, Peter Novick was a professor of French history at the University of Chicago. He authored this really great study of the American historical uh, profession and the kind of emergence of it through the end of the 19th century and the end of, through the end of the 20th. And Novick did a great job of using the idea of objectivity to discuss how 
history moved from being a literary art for American historians to more of a social scientific enterprise. But what I also appreciated about it was his remarkable ability to kind of hold this very perspicacious analysis in equipoise with tremendously wonderful gossipy stuff about all these American historians I'd been reading about for, you know, since I started college. So this idea that, one, you could do this great rigorous disciplinary history and then basically wed it with Time, Mag or the People Magazine kind of uh, rereading of American historians was fantastic to me. So I, I like that, again, appreciation of the high and low that I got with the books that I enjoyed in high school. And this was sort of a, uh, a kind of academic version thereof. Is there a book in your work now that influences you? Um, yeah, so I, my background is in religious studies, and one of the most influential authors on in the way I think about, the, about religion is a, a scholar named uh, Jonathan C. Smith, who recently passed away. Um, Smith is famous for authoring um, a series of essays which were collected into an edited volume called Imagining Religion, and in the introduction to that book, he um, makes a sort of bold, provocative claim that there are no data for religion, that the category of religion itself is a creation of the scholar's imagination. And this notion seems simultaneously kind of banal, like, yes, of course, what they say is religion is what religion is, but at the same time, it's also incredibly profound because it suggests the role of the author in constructing the universe that they're writing about. And we don't usually think about that in the context of academic writing. And so for me, it was very, very eye-opening to see how certain things that we understand as being kind of unexceptional or even invisible are very much constructed. And they're actually intellectual creations that get reified, rendered essential, and we don't really think about them. And I'd say it's influential in my library work in a way because um, one of the things that I appreciate about librarianship is that it's an incredibly dynamic field, but I think far too frequently, at least historically, we think of ourselves sort of hemmed in by a set of duties because we understand a library to mean one thing. And for me, a library has always indicated a site, not a suite of duties. And so by kind of reconstructing or at least treating it in an expanded field, my idea of librarianship, I wanted to kind of kick against the kind of historical limitations or at least the um, limits to the imagination that we have historically had about the work that we do. So I feel like my work in librarianship ranges across instruction, across um, obviously collections, and a tremendous amount of outreach. And um, just knowing that I don't have to accept a received notion of librarianship, that I can build it out in inventive ways or challenge it, um, is something that uh, I got from Smith. Is there a book that you like to share with friends and family? Yes. So, uh, despite the fact that I've been talking about almost exclusively nonfiction work, um, one of the books I enjoy sharing with folks is actually a work of fiction. And um, perhaps because I've spent so many years in higher education, it is a book set in higher ed. Um, so, John William Stoner um, is a really deeply moving, effective, and somewhat sad narrative about um, a small town. Um, Missouri boy who becomes a college professor, and it's all about the kind of frustrations, limitations, and genuine human pathos that one feels going through a life in higher ed, along with all the other kind of things that one encounters, um, just growing up and being very human. This is set in the mid-1940s um, and 30s. Uh, it's a fantastic book. It's one that I always recommend to folks. Um, as a, as a counterpoint, I also like to recommend um, Kingsley Amos's Lucky Jim, which is also a campus novel. Um, it is incredibly funny. It's problematic in certain ways, but it's an incredibly funny story, send-up of academic life. It also includes probably the best description I've ever read of what it's like to suffer from a hangover. Can you tell me about the gift book you remember? Yeah, actually I can think of a couple. So one of the things that I appreciate about guest books are, are ones that come from friends who have written them. So I've, you know, having friends who are professors, um, I've received several. So one of them I uh, received not too long ago was my friend Joshua Glick, who wrote a book about documentary making in Los Angeles in the 1960s. My friend Matthew Handelman recently completed a book about um, mathematics in the Frankfurt School, but Speaking of fiction, the most recent book I received was from one of my nearest and dearest friends, Miranda Popke, who is a novelist, and this is her first novel. It's called Topics of Conversation. 
and it was um, very widely um, reviewed and received well. She got a write-up in the New York Times above the fold, a picture of herself, which I was super proud about. Um, and it's a fantastic, very, again, deeply moving and effective um, series of conversations between a woman and other women about power, about sex, about gender relations, motherhood, professional life. And I'm just really excited that she was able to not only publish it um, and that it's getting such great press, but it is truly a great book and I'm excited about the literary career she has in front of her too. What are you reading now? I'm currently reading a book by a friend. So um, my friend, one of my good friends from grad school, uh, Benji Brolsky, um, recently authored a book called The Rise and Fall of the Religious Left, which is a cultural history, kind of American religious and cultural history of um, the religious left in the 1970s using the television shows of Norman Lear, so All in the Family, Jefferson's, uh, Sanford and Son, Maud, as a way of describing how Lear wanted to reimagine um, how religious life, or at least public discourse about religion, could be shifted away from what was then an emerging incipient Christian right. And it culminates in the creation of this organization called People for the American Way, which is still in existence, which is sort of a counterpoint to um, organizations like the Moral Majority or eventually the Christian Coalition. And it concludes with um, this analysis of a variety show that Lear hosted or put together in 1980 or 81, which starred all of those figures from those Lear um, sitcoms from the 70s, as well as then newer stars like um, Robin Williams and Steve Martin, as a way, again, of kind of reclaiming uh, religious language in, a, in, a, in the public square um, in the name of, of uh, the virtues and, and values of, of American liberalism. Well, that's interesting. I think um, you've given lot, us lots to read, but thinking a little bit about writers, who you could write, invite three writers to know. Well, the good, that's a great question because I was thinking if, it, if I wanted writers who were going to be fun versus writers I actually wanted to have profound conversations with. If I wanted writers who could be fun, I think I'd probably go with um, Christopher Hitchens, Martin Amos, and Clive James. Um, so there's a series of memoirs by Christopher Hitchens and mostly by Clive James, who was an Australian writer who very recently passed away and is one of my nearest, dearest favorite writers ever. Um, and they describe these kind of uh, boozy lunches that are incredibly um, witty and filled with all sorts of literary illusion and um, levity, and it just seems like something fun to participate in. But I think if I invited three writers over to have a profound conversation or pick their brains, I'd probably um, start with Isaiah Berlin, who was an English philosopher of, of, of or historical philosopher, I should say, a historian of ideas, and um, who was also known for his incredibly, um, incredibly sharp, fast, and witty banter. Um, and inevitably, because somebody who likes a well-wrought phrase, I'd love to see, I'd love to have a conversation with Oscar Wilde. It's kind of impossible not to want to. Um, and as a counterpoint to Wilde, of course, Dorothy Parker, just to sort of, you know, round up that wit, um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, Gain some wonderful, wonderfully funny and fun insights through, uh, through the conversation in the evening. What will you read next? Um, I think the next book that I have on my docket is a history of airlines. <laughs> Believe it or not, I actually have a soft spot or a very idiosyncratic interest in commercial aviation. And so um, I stumbled across this book on the history of airlines. And so I've been pouring my way through it. Um, it is intensely fascinating in ways that you wouldn't imagine. Um, and so uh, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of love that I've actually had since I was a kid, since pouring through those world book at, um, encyclopedias and, and, and making, making uh, time to read the A section over and over again. Well, thank you for sharing. You're very welcome.